it's not really a lecture, it's more of an interactive uh, dialogue. So let's just begin by just being here. Just breathe and relax into being here right now. Notice your, the sounds around you, the sound of my voice. Heart <clears throat> comes and goes in silence. The sound of your own breathing, how that comes and goes too. Any construction sounds, I know some of you have construction going on. Those sounds come and go too, the coughing, breathing. Everything comes and goes, but you who notices it are always here. You are the noticing, the watching, the experiencing of the sound. You are always here. Just pay attention to now to the feelings in your body, the sensations, feelings and emotions in your body. How they shift and change, they come and they go. But you who notices them are always here. You are the awareness, the presence, the consciousness, the beingness, which is always notices everything. And finally, shift your attention to you, toward your mind. Look, look within your own mind and notice the thoughts activity. Thoughts coming and going, shifting and changing. Even the I thought, the ego thought, comes and goes. Even the thought you most intimately identify with as I, me, this is who I am. That thought comes and goes too. The storyteller is no more real than the stories it tells. So just relax into who you really are, this pure awareness, pure consciousness, pure beingness, pure openness. It is here right now. And breathe into that and just enjoy the feeling of being relaxed and present right here, right now. And this is what I teach. This is what awakening is. Awakening is all about getting in touch with what is always here. And what is always here is this pure energy, pure awareness pure openness that's here right now. And I teach a form of meditation these days called mirror meditation. I invite people to look into the mirror at themselves and affirm this, I am not my ego. I am not my ego. You do this quietly now if you want. Just affirm that I am not my ego. Why are you not your ego? Because your ego comes and goes. The ego thought, the I thought, the me thought comes and goes. Everything comes and goes. And awakening is all about getting in touch with what is, doesn't come and go, which, what is, with what is always here, which is pure consciousness, pure awareness. This, this is what we are, folks. We are this. And the the, the Dao De Jing, if any of you have read it, by Lao Tzu, ancient Chinese book of philosophy, the, the, it begins with these words, the Dao, which is spirit or energy, God, if you, if you want to speak of it in Western language, the Tao that can be named is not the Tao. If name be needed, wonder names it. So what we are really cannot be named. But if name be needed, wonder or joy or 
peace or flow or harmony names it. So I invite people to look into the mirror for 10 minutes a day. Sit back behind their ego eye, realizing ever more deeply that you're not your ego. You have an ego, but you're not your ego. You have thoughts, but you're not your thoughts. You have a body, but you're not your body, right? The body's gone through many changes. The older we get, the more we notice the changes. So the more and more we realize that we're not a, our ego, the freer we are. Now, in my new book called Untriggerable, we come to this realization by three individual teachings. First teaching is realizing what we are by seeing what we're not. We're not our thoughts. We're not our body, we're not our feelings, we're not our emotions, because all these come and go. We are the awareness, and, and gradually we see that we're, we're not anything that we think we are, and that brings us more closely to who and what we really are, which cannot be said or defined ultimately. You only be what you are. You can't really talk about it. And the same thing is it triggers, right? We all get, the ego gets triggered. The ego gets, has, always has a story and gets triggered when things don't align with the story or its expectation. And we've got to welcome these triggers because it's showing us where we're not yet free. So I'm going to open this up now. And uh, I, want to, I want to think about when you were last, I want you to think about when you were last triggered by anything. And then I will, I will invite someone to share whether that trigger was, who was willing to be open and vulnerable. And um, I'll teach you how to, show you how, to, how I work with it and how you can work, more importantly, how you can work with it to deal with your own triggers. And eventually you begin, begin to realize, my God, my triggers are showing me where I'm not yet free. The more I welcome them, the more I love them, the, the less power they have over me. You begin to think to yourself, bring it on, bring it on. I want to see where I'm not yet free. And that's the beginning of real freedom. Because in the minute you face, face your demons, so to speak, really face your demons, then uh, you're well on your road to freedom. It's not all Irish saying. If you run away from a ghost, it'll chase you and haunt you for the rest of your life. But if you stop and turn and face it, it'll disappear because ghosts aren't real. So I want you to think about a time recently when you were triggered and I want anybody to share, put up their hand, Tell, share about that with me and we'll talk about it. Did we just put hands up? Yeah. And then I unmute, unmute the microphone and uh, we'll have a dialogue. Joe has his hand up. Yeah, well, a lot of us do. Okay, right. thanks. Yeah, it, it would help if you call on us too, Jim, so we know who, if we have hands up. Anyway, um, yeah, so it, uh, you asked for a, a recent moment of being triggered. And I was, um, I was driving on the uh, 210 and had to get off. It, a sign came up in the exit half a mile to the exit. And I got over and I'm trying to get over to the right lane. It was like a quarter mile. And I let somebody in. I let somebody in in front of me, a car, just... I guess to be nice. And then I had to get over. But this semi 
that was in the same lane saw that I had let that car in and figured he would jump in too. And if he did that, I, would, I couldn't have made the exit. I would have had to go a few more miles down the road, turn around, go a few. So I had to get over there. And so he, he started increasing his speed. Well, I lived in Boston enough years that I know how to make a move and I'll be there. And right. so I did that. And I just moved in front. I signaled and then I moved. And he was surprised, apparently, that I had, that I had not let him in too. You know, that I, but, but he didn't know. I had to make that move. I had to be in there. So I moved and surprised him. Ah, you know, those things are loud, those horns. Yes. Ah, and I, it just infuriated me because he was wrong on two counts to try to cut me off and then to be angry because I took my rightful spot. And I would never be rude enough to, to flip him off. I would not do that. But I put up my fist aggressively like that. And that was my, you know, I yielded to the temptation of getting into this whole anger thing. And then I got in and I started making the exit ramp and he pulls up fast so that he's on the, on the, on the freeway running parallel to me as I'm exiting the ramp. Ah, and then he, and I'm supposed to look over at him because our windows are aligned and I don't, I just hold the fist like this. Um, and you know, I, the fact that I had yielded to the anger, his anger and his stuff, and I hooked right into it immediately. It was like an immediate reaction. If somebody had told me, okay, now there's going to be a guy that's coming up acting in a way that's, that's very provocative. That's going to come up in about 30 seconds. I could be prepared for it and I could be smooth. But when it happens suddenly, I have no expectation of it. That's the, that's for me, that's the trickiest time. That's the most, when I'm, I'm, the temptation, and I, I unfortunately, I, I'm not proud of what I did, but just yielded to it. Anyway, that's that's my example of uh, being right. tricked. Right. Well, it sounds, it sounds like you're a very aware and a conscious man in general, right? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I try to be. I, I really try to be. Thank you. Yeah, so you just come back to being here now, and maybe you'll do the move. Have you looked at yourself in the mirror lately, like a, for a conscious way? I have not done that exercise, no. So do it. And I recommend you do it. And st start with the affirmation, I'm not my ego. I'm not my ego. I'm not my ego. And then s s step back behind yourself, behind the eye thought, behind the ego eye. And just view yourself in a place of pure openness and awareness. And you'll be surprised at what comes up and you'll realize more and more that actually there's only this moment now. The timeless flow of now. People who are awake and free realize that above all. They have a mind. They can honor the past and keep an eye on the future, including setting goals and making plans. All right, somebody else. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Do you want to call him, sir? I I I, I can't see anybody. Oh, um, Kim, I'll ask a question. Yes. Do you ever lose your temper at this point in your life? No. Never. I'm just always, I, I'm just always here now. I mean, occasionally I get pissed off, uh, but I, I notice when I'm pissed off and I'm just. Because we, this is the thing. Jean Klein, my teacher, called them residues. Because we still have an ego. I still have an ego. But I, I just realize I'm not it. This is the big thing about awakening or enlightenment. To realize you're not your ego. You have an ego, but you're not your ego. So mostly I'm just right here, right now. Always... The more awake and free we are, the more we live in the present moment. Because the present moment is just, this is it. There's nowhere else other than this moment now, right? No matter what the clock says, the time is always now.
I would suggest that we have somebody monitor the hands that are coming up and then call on people in order, Jim, because I know you can't see them. And I, and I saw uh, Vishali had her hand up ever since the start of this thing. And uh, if I pronounced your name correctly, uh, and, and Michael uh, has his hand up. And uh, Bonnie also. Bonnie also. Yeah, Bonnie has had her hand up, and so has, has Mary Grace. So Sorry. maybe if we could do, kind of do them in order, maybe start with Vishali, Bonnie, yeah. uh, Michael, and Mary Grace, if that's okay. That's great. I mean, thank you. And, and thank you, Tim. Yeah. Hey, so, Vishali. Hey, how are you? So, um, all right, so I recently got triggered and I've been working with it and letting it go and picking it up again and letting it go and mostly letting it go now, but um, I have to, you know, I have to move. Now, to, to the generosity of the, the people that own this place, I have six months. Um, another friend of mine um, has to move and she um, has to go quicker. So she was looking for apartments before I even thought of it. And she knew I wasn't in a hurry, but she knew I had to move. So she saw an apartment that she didn't want, but she never said, suggested that I look at it. Turns out that it came to my attention after it was rented. And um, she says, oh, I knew about that apartment the whole time. And I said, why didn't you tell me? It was everything I needed. It was such an upgrade. It was only $100 more a month, two bedrooms, two bathrooms, a lot. It was everything, Jim, I could have possibly imagined. In Sedona, to get you know, a place with, that was relatively uh, reasonable, was yeah. off, off the charts and and i said to her, well, you know like i would have taken that why didn't you tell me and she said well i didn't think you were in a hurry i said i'm not in a hurry but i still have to move so i have to say that you know i looked at that apartment because it's another friend that ended up renting it i looked at that apartment and it was absolutely everything i could have ever wanted in an apartment and i have to move and i'm just like letting it go but like really disappointed that 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 had transpired the way it did all right so um who is this me who's disappointed the one that needs a place to live but yes <laughs> uh, i've been there yes i've been working with them yeah yeah so you you, the ego, you uh, the ego wants to you know wants this nice lovely comfort. sure and so the ego has its needs and my ego too has a need to be in a comfortable, safe environment. Yeah. Everybody does. Mm -hmm. So it didn't work out this time, but maybe it'll work out something better down coming down the road. Anyway, it's, it's a beautiful, you got to see your ego disappointment. Mm -hmm. So you welcome that, love it, and then just come back to the present moment now, because really you realize more and more that this moment now is it, baby. It's, this is this is all there is here now. And the more and more you live from here now, you live from this moment now, and you open yourself up to this moment now. You look around you and you see what beauty there is in life, what joy there is in life, hmm. right here now. Good to see you, Shelley. Thanks, you too. <laughs> okay, then we have Bonnie, Michael, and Mary Grace in that order. For me, Bye. I'm um, uh, dealing with a lot of emotions coming up because dealing with old stuff. And during COVID, I've had a lot of time to, to think about that. I know I kind of will get feelings like, I'm being treated like my father treated me, and he always criticized, like last Monday, uh, a week ago Monday, I was in another group, we were, I was going to get together with someone, we were just going to chat, and then between um, a call about the union election, which is going to be interesting this year, and of course my brother, all kinds of stuff, and then this woman says, no, I have time to meet, I'm not going to meet with you. And we were going to meet on a weekly basis, and and it angered me so much. Part of me wanted to just bring her back. I mean, really like wake up. And then I realized, though, it's because my father, no matter what I'd say, sometimes I'd say nothing, and he'd say I said something, or I, 
I'm really having trouble with someone that will not budge. It just reminds me of my father and that it drives me nuts. Um, right. Staying in the moment I know helps. Uh, it's easy to go back in the past. And we've had several experiences like that recently, but I'm more aware of where it comes from. So what's your question? Um, when someone seems to argue a point and it seems so wrong, but they won't budge. It reminds me, I feel like I'm dealing with my father again. And he's yeah. lost. It's very hard to let go. That would be it. So just breathe and relax, Bonnie. Just breathe and relax into the present moment. Do you have a mirror in your room here, there? Can you see a mirror anywhere? My mat, but the other room. Other All right. Room. Have you looked look at yourself in the mirror lately? I mean, in a conscious, present way? A little bit, not so much. All right. So do that for 10 minutes a day. Just close it, open your eyes, gaze at yourself without judgment, without anything. If judgments come up, just let them come up and let them pass. And affirm to yourself, I'm not my ego. I'm not my ego. Say that out aloud now. I'm not my ego. Now, say it again. I'm not my ego. One more, one more time with the eyes closed. I'm not my ego. Now, how does that resonate for you? Starting to get in touch with that, I think, because I've really been working on a lot of feelings lately. Um, well, okay, good. So you open your eyes now. So um, I promise you, as you become more and more familiar and trusting of that experience, my God, I'm not my ego. Of course I'm not my ego, because my ego comes and goes. I'm not anything that comes and goes. I am what is always here. I'm always, the, the beautiful conscious being is always here. I promise you, the more you affirm that, the more you get it. The more you, the more inner peace and calm you'll experience, regardless of what's happening outside, regardless of your old memories. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Bonnie. Okay, so we have Michael, then followed by Mary Grace. Good morning, Jim. It's Michael. Uh, hey, Michael. Yeah, I, I, uh, a lot of what you're saying brings back the uh, what I experienced in the Gurdjieff work, which I did be beginning, uh, I don't know, 25 years ago, 30 years ago, where it was um, self-observation. And self-observation was a means of really getting past the ego. Uh, the Gurdjieff work basically assumed that we all created different egos for different people and that the ego was sort of a mechanism and we had to get past it to come to the present moment yes. and get to get out of the trap of the ego. I, recently, I, um, my cell phone was destroyed and I had to order a new one. And I ordered my new cell phone. I assumed it would be there in two days. I followed the tracking information and I found that the, in the wisdom, of course, of the COVID era, my cell phone had been shipped to Jacksonville, Florida. Uh -huh. All of a sudden, oh, guess what? Um, you know, it was going to cost me another week and a half of delay to get my new cell phone. So I called up the company and I lost it in colors at the top of my lungs. This is something I had not done. I'd been very cool about everything. You know, I had just, you know, just dealt with all of this. But this time I went symphonic. The whole uh -huh. thing, it all came out. I think it was just like all of the repressed anger, frustration, everything else, just with both the shipper and the company. And, uh, you know, I was, you know, sort of value for money. It was a good show. But <clears throat> it was an interesting episode where the ego, anger, frustration just emerged. I just, the trigger totally caused me to lose it. And uh, 
So it's sort of interesting that to my sense of what you're saying, the ego is always there. It's the substrate. It is the bottom line. It's where a lot of memories, and for me as an author, it's where a lot of valuable stuff is actually stored that I access. But I do need to live on the higher order most of the time. How do you respond to that? Good, thank you. Um, actually, the ego is not the substrate. The ego is the substrate of the personality. Mm -hmm. but we're not our personality. We are, what we are is pure awareness, pure consciousness, mm -hmm. pure openness, manifesting in this body, mind, personality. And so you've got to get beyond the ego. But as a question, Jim, honestly, we need a personality to function in the world. And yeah. that's one of the issues in the work that I did with Gurdjieff, is that even though there's a difficulty in some of this stuff, you do need a personality. You do need functioning aspects of yourself to function in the world. And that's what the problem is here. You can't just function on pure consciousness. No, of course not. We have, we, we have a personality. And uh, in fact, the more, the freer we are, the more awake we are, the more, the more our true personality emerges. Well. So, so Michael, you'll still be Michael. I'll still be Jim with his, I'll still be, have my unique personality characteristics. Mm-hmm. The, the, they'll now be more organic and harmonious and flowing. Now, when you lost it with the um, cell phone and blew up, Jean Klein, my teacher, would have said you just experienced a very strong residue. You know, we have eager residues. So, so when someone wakes up, like wakes up to the truth of who they are, my God, I'm. I'm this, I thought I never thought it was that. <coughs> they um they become eighty percent of their anger or whatever leaves them. Eighty percent of the negative aspects of the personality just fall away. Mm -hmm. Because that's what happens when you wake up. But you still have residues of old ego patterns that you used to have. No, they, they can come up from time to time. But to answer your question, the ego is the substrate of the personality. But the, the ego it, it drives the coming and going of our erratic or neurotic personality traits. But when you see through the ego, when you see that you're not your ego, you have an ego, but you're not your ego. Mm -hmm. Everything falls away, and as I said, 80% of the, the negative aspects of the ego fall away, mm -hmm. and the personality. Mm -hmm. And you, then you, you're just here now. You're really just present now. You live in the present moment. You, you use your mind for, to remember the past, honor the past, and keep an eye on the future, setting goals and planning. But you live always essentially right here, right now, in this very moment now. Yeah, I, I take that. I mean, having done the work for as long as I have, being in the present moment is a very, very difficult thing to do. I know from a lot of experience, it is hard to do. It's only, so, it's only hard to do when we're coming from our ego. The ego is, tries to be present, <clears throat> but it's only present when really um, its needs are being met, right? What's happy with what's going on. This is the whole thing about awakening. When we see we're not our ego, we have an ego, but we're not our ego, then the whole world opens up. When you really get that, when I have an ego, but I'm not my ego. The whole world opens up. Then you, then you don't need to be defined by anything. You need no self-definition because you're, then you're open to everything. That's the cure for man, mankind or humankind suffering, is to wake up, truly wake up. 
and be free. Mm -hmm. And then we operate from our true selves, our beautiful, conscious, loving selves. We're, we truly are colorblind. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, Mary Grace was next. Uh, yesterday, um, I was very surprised that I had this huge reaction. Um, I went into a coffee place, <clears throat> Starbucks, and um, ordered something to go. And <clears throat> um, there was a young mother there with probably a three-year-old son. Um, and for whatever reason, it just, oh gosh. Um, I just flashed on the memory of being the young mother with a three-year-old son. And the depth of uh, loving that I have for my son and we're completely estranged now. And uh -oh. uh, the depth of I, how much I miss him, just so incredibly painful. I was surprised that I had that reaction because I see lots of mothers with young boys and children, but somehow this, somehow this really just reached down inside me. Uh, I flashed on several specific memories of when he was that age and really the joy that I had and how I just adore him was, uh, oh God, it was excruciating. And I went to my car, you know, and I it was helpful that exercise you did with me all those years ago of um, putting my hands on the shoulder of this broken hearted mother and um, and that helped um, being able to go to me observing this mother with feeling like she had a broken heart. Yes. And it this happens to me every once in a while, not a lot, but it's I never expect it. It just comes out of left field and. Um, uh, I know the observer part of me knows that uh, this is the this is the most unwanted gift that I think the universe has given me because the the pain of this of going through this has really served to kind of rip open to where I have the experiences that I do of um, what I call the more. Um, so. The more? Say more about that. Um, can, you, can it be said? Non the non-ordinary. Right. The, uh, yeah, the, the non-ordinary. Um, yeah. Yeah. So you just have one son, Mary Grace? I'm sorry, what? You just have one son? One biological son. Yeah, I have other I I have other stepchildren and other people that I relate to as uh my children, you know, they call me mom, but, but mm -hmm. I have one biological son, yeah. He he's the one you're estranged from? Yes. I'm not estranged from him, he's estranged from me. So, um, how old is he? 45. He's a therapist. What? He's a therapist? He's a therapist. Yeah. Where does he practice therapy? Where? Yeah. He's, he's a Freudian. He's in Boston. And what's his name? Mark. So, why is he estranged from you? Um, you know, I... I have beliefs of why he is in his childhood, which was uh, 
he thought I should have known something that I didn't know that was happening to him outside of our home. Uh, I, I know I didn't. Um, but when I, uh, it, it's been on and off really since he turned, since he went into puberty. So it, it's not new, but there were some years there when his now 10 year old daughter, um, uh, when she was born, um, there was a few years there where uh, he seemed to kind of do 180 degrees and he still very much supports my relationship with his daughter. I'm very close to her. Oh, uh, good. Yeah. But you, 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 when did you last speak with him? With him? Yeah. A couple of years ago. And you'd obviously like a closer relationship with him, obviously, right? And there was always an underlying um, rage toward me, anger. You know, I, I, I've done lots of personal work on this, and, and I still do when it comes up. Um, you know, it, it's been a journey for me to uh, uh, not have the obsessive thing of what did I do, what did I do, what did I do? I have more of an understanding of that. I just, uh, I just really miss him terribly. Yes, of course. I, I have a, but one biological son is 35, and if I was estranged from him, I'd miss him, miss him too. Yeah. So, what's the basic story you still hold around your son? It sounds like, what did you, what did they do wrong? Is that the basic story? Well, that that was the theme for many years since he was, a, you know, turned went into puberty. And now I, uh, we had some interaction. I I never do with him by himself. His husband and Sam. I always have them present because he's very different if he's witnessed by other people. Um, and we had communication back and forth. So I have more, you know, kind of understanding of the dynamic there. So I did hold, I did something terrible to my son. I, I did something bad. I was a bad mother. I mean, that was what I obsessed about for years. And, uh, you know, trying everything I could to make amends. But I, I do know now that um, uh, I'm always remained open to any kind of dialogue to work things out. But he, he isn't open to that. And um, uh, it's really just allowing things to be. Um, so I don't hold myself hostage or villainize myself like I did for so many years. It's just the pain. I just miss him so much. Yeah, of course. Let me ask you this. Have you truly forgiven yourself for your relationship with your son? Uh, you know, it's something that I include in this chanting every morning that I do. It's um, I forgive myself for any mistakes I made, you know, as a mother. I, of course, I made some mistakes. Of course, I did. And I've acknowledge those to him many times and that doesn't help on his side but it does help on my side because I truly have acknowledged any mistakes I've made as a mother and you know follow that with what I know is I adored my son then I still do now and I absolutely did the very best I knew how to do at the yeah, time of course you did. Uh, yeah I really I totally get that. I totally know that. And that that's helpful to me to know that. Let me ask you this. Are you completely free of your I thought? Of my I thoughts? Yeah, the ego thought, the I thought, the Mary Grace character. I doubt it because it's just so when I could talk about it. Most of the time, I'm kind of okay with it. You know, it's a chanting every morning. I have a place that I do with sending him loving energy. And um, uh, so I feel really 
fine after that. Most of the time in my life I do, but boy, something like this comes along and it just is devastating. So now I'm clearly not free with this. Well, good. This is so welcome. This this is a beautiful opportunity to become free. Have you gazed at yourself in the mirror recently? No. We'll, we'll do it for ten minutes a day. Okay. Just do it, and then affirm to yourself, "I'm not my ego." And, and notice that the truth of that, because your ego comes and goes. You're not you're not anything that comes and goes. You're what, you're what is always here. So in the mirror me meditation, you're getting in touch with what you always are, right here, right now. Yeah, when I do this chanting in the morning, I very much get into that place. And, um, and I feel free of it, you know. Right. So the, <laughs> when something like this happens, it's... Just right. Boy, oh boy. So the meditation is just a more direct way of facing yourself. Chanting is kind of like more of a band aid. But facing yourself in the mirror, truly facing yourself, truly asking yourself the question: Who am I really? Who am I? Who am I beyond my ego? That's a more direct way. Okay, I'll, I'll do that. All right, sweetie. Love you. Love you too. Appreciate you. Thank you. We got three minutes left. Three minutes. Maybe time for one more if someone wants to raise their hand that hasn't, uh, hasn't gone. Okay, then I'll, I'll just conclude by speaking. So, whatever the problem, whatever the issue, whatever we're struggling with, we always come back to now. One of, the, one of the early titles of my book was Welcome to Now. This is how we, be, we become untriggerable. We come back to now, come back to this moment now. And then for, from here now, we see everything with new eyes. We get a fresh perspective on our situation, our life. Remember the time is always now, no matter what the clock says, the time is always now. I want to thank you all for your attention this morning, your participation. I've enjoyed it. And uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jim. Thank you, Jim. Uh, before, we, before we go into business, I would like to welcome a couple of new people, some new guests. Uh, Vishali Shaheen, would you introduce yourself to everybody? Hi. Um, my name is Vishali Shaheen, and I live in Sedona, Arizona. Um, yeah, I, I know Jim from doing some personal work with him a few years back, and I really didn't know what I was getting onto this morning. I just thought it, <laughs> it was like this. I thought he was going to do some work like he's doing, um, but it sounds like you're, you guys are a cohesive group. Uh, is, I mean, who, are you a group that gets together a lot? We get together every week, and you're very welcome to join us. Um, Jim can send and every us Tuesday a, morning, seven a.m. Uh, I send out a, a Zoom link every week, and uh, so you're very, very welcome to join us. I'm sure Jim will give you my email address, and I'd be happy to send that to you so you can join us each week. Love to have you. Thank you. Thank you for your sharing that. And I was on the verge of tears. So. Thank you, and blessings to you and your son. And I'd like to welcome Eugenia Joe Regan. Would you introduce yourself? Eugenia. Yeah, I heard you. Uh, <clears throat> just had to undo mute. Uh, introduce. Well, 
this is my second time um, with the group. I got to come last week and I'm impressed with the, the depth of listening. Um, I was involved in a Thich Nhat Hanh group for a number of years and, and the deep listening, the personal listening, I think is what really matters a lot to me. And I appreciate the, um, the depth of listening and concern that's expressed in this group. Thank you for letting me be part of it. Is there anybody else that I've forgotten? Who? Well, uh, I'd like to introduce my son, uh, Bruce. It's Inger. Yeah, Inger. Oh, hi, hi, Bruce. Bruce. Bruce, yes, hello. Hello, my name is Bruce Stratton, and I dig your, uh, your class today. Uh, I like the idea of saying I'm not my ego, or this could be my new mantra, with, along with the mirror. Thank you very much. Thank you.